Good morning, Trinity Church. Hey, let's stand together as we open up with the song of worship, declaring the praises of our Lord Jesus. Here we go. The King of all creation set aside his crown, a servant to the Father's love, descended from his throne. King this morning. Guys, why don't you turn around this morning and uh, greet someone nearby? Good morning and welcome to Trinity Church. I feel like everyone's ready for summer. We're chatting. It's just last service too. Everyone was getting up, chatting. I love it. I love it. Um, my name is Allison Anderson and I have the joy of working for Micah House, which is our Trinity sponsored after school program in North Redlands. And I am so thrilled on Sunday mornings when we get to come together. I love 
that God laid it out in his word that we should meet together, gather together at least once a week, fellowship, see friends and family, have a time to say hello and good morning. I just, it brings me such joy to hear all, all the chatter around this room. Uh, if you're new here this morning, welcome. I hope you just met somebody. Um, I hope that you feel welcome and we are so glad you're here. We do more than just Sunday morning at Trinity. We have things going on all week um, for men, for women, for children. If you are interested in finding out more, we would love to get you that information. We have a couple of ways to do that. One is our welcome table out on the plaza. We have people who have information and would love to welcome you and chat with you. Uh, the other is in the seat pocket in front of you, there's a little card. You can fill out the information there and just pop it in the offering basket and we will send you the stuff that you need. So you're welcome to do that either way. One of the things we have starting up uh, next week is our women's ministry does something over the summer called Summer Solitude. And they do it in Wednesdays in June. And it is exactly what it sounds like, Summer Solitude. It happens in summer. You come, you sit, you read God's word. It's very quiet. It's very peaceful is probably the best word for it. There is child care provided if you need it. So we invite you to join us for those weeks in June. Also coming up, Next weekend is one of my favorite things that Trinity does. It's called Discover uh, God's Design. And the intent of this class is to look at the ways God has uniquely designed you. And he has given each one of us different talents and abilities. And there are things that God has made for only you to do, for only me to do. And what happens in this class is you look at some of those things and then look at how the ministries of Trinity Church and the community in the world, how your gifts pair up with the needs that are there and finding some things um, that you can reach uh, out into your community and share Christ with people through the ways that you are uniquely created. So that will be next Sunday. It's one afternoon or one morning rather. Um, you come, you talk, you chat and, uh, and just see what God has for you. So the other way that um, we are reaching out is Camp SOS Island, Trinity Kids Camp. It has a new name this year, and so I'm struggling to remember how to say it, but Trinity Kids Camp. And we have hundreds of kids on our campus from both Trinity Church and the community that come. We have over 75 different electives that they get to choose from, classes. They get to go swimming, play soccer, do archery, fun stuff like that. And we have 33 kids from Micah House that are coming, and um, we're so excited to have them. And we have another 35 kids from the community that are requesting financial aid to be able to come. So we want to get all of those kids to camp. We don't want money to be a barrier to them coming here and hearing the name of Jesus. So if it's $150 per kid to come, if you would like to sponsor a kid or part of a kid, um, or part of a kid's tuition, not part of a kid. <laughs> oh my word. Um, is that live streamed? Um, anyway. Put some money in the offering basket, Mark Camp, kid, Trinity Kids Camp, and we'll get those kids to camp. So um, I am also thrilled this morning to... And, uh, let's yeah, just declare that we are the Lord's. <laughs> Oh 
guys, we're gonna we're gonna invite the ushers forward uh, during this next song. So if you want to take a seat for a little bit, uh, they're gonna make their way forward and receive the offering. If you're a guest with us this morning, please don't feel any obligation to give and just be our guest. But I encourage you, when the basket goes by, please uh, stand and join us again as we continue to sing.
Good morning, Trinity Church. How you doing? It's great to see you today. Uh, it's a great video. It's Andrew Peterson, uh, Dancing in the Minefield. What an interesting song related to marriage. <laughs> You're like, oh, uh, if you've been married for a little while, you actually know what that's talking about. And I love the way that they portray uh, couples who, like, we're going to get to meet Bill and Ruth this morning, uh, who have really just continued to dance. And I love that. So before we get to know them a little bit, I want to put out to you today, you must have gotten the memo. It's a packed house. We're talking about sex. So you're here. You're ready to go. I love it. Word got out. Um, but let me say two things. Number one, if you're a guest, this is a little bit different Sunday than normal. We're in a series called One Plus One Equals One talking about the oneness of marriage. But also, um, if you have kids that are under 13, I've said to you before, this is a PG-13 message, probably the third time I've said that, I really mean it today. First service would tell you, okay? So I'm just saying that, that's your call. If you haven't had the talk with your kids, I'm gonna do that for you, okay? <laughs> so just know, it's, it's happening one way or the other, and you're welcome if you wanna do something else, that's up to you, okay? This is Bill and Ruth Larson. Would you say hello to them today? Fan club. Great. Well, if you know you've been in this series with us, we've had the privilege of getting to know some couples over the course of the way. And so I want to ask you guys, tell us a little bit about how long you've been married, about your kids, grandkids, stuff like that. Oh, Is this rare to go here? Yeah, get a little closer. I can hardly believe we've been married 64 years. 64 years. <laughs> so great. Oh, by the way, look. You, you look up just the same. I could barely whoa, tell. Whoa, 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 whoa. There you go. This is awesome. Very. Mm -hmm. Marriage, yes. It's great. Believe me, it's great. Even 64 I, years. I, uh, I can hardly believe that the first 12 years of my life on a farm in Minnesota would bring me something that would feed right into marriage and uh, help us immensely. Uh, 12 years, my Your first parents. 12 years. Your parents. And uh, my parents showed a great example to me because there was no fighting. There were discussions in the home, but there was no fighting. My brother and older brother and sister never came to me and said, hey, mom and dad are fighting. It never happened. And that didn't uh, really strike me too much until 12 years after that, heading for marriage, I realized that uh, a lot of people were struggling. And I, from that, early experience decided, no, we're going to smooth this out and come to the Lord in prayer, and we did, and uh, did it faithfully, and we've been blessed immensely through these 64 years, and are grateful to the Lord for that. So here's my spouse. <laughs> we have, we have uh, three sons, three daughter-in-laws, and seven grandchildren, and uh, we have had some challenges lost a daughter-in-law. We have had uh, several challenges, but you know what? The keynote of our life has been prayer. We started praying on our honeymoon, and we haven't stopped. And uh, we just thank the Lord for each other because uh, we are one. And uh, the way we stay connected is we've been on mission trips together and worked for the Lord together. And uh, now, because we don't have any children at home and it's very quiet and wonderful. <laughs> and there's uh, hope. There's there hope is. There's second. hope at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> and it's wonderful. And, uh, you know, I never did worry about an empty nest. That was a real blessing to me. I had friends that were crying when they took their kids to school. I couldn't understand that. <laughs> I was praising the Lord. <laughs> and what I was going to say is that Bill and I have time now to pray together more. We read the word together and we discuss the word together. So that's really great. But I really do thank the Lord for Bill and how God put him in my life. I was really hunting and God, <laughs> God just brought him and dropped him into my life. And I thank the Lord for the 64 years. I can't believe we're so old. <laughs> yes, yes, the hiking did bring us together. He's a hiker and I'm not. And I kept telling him I was the motel type. But he didn't believe me and neither did our three sons. 
And so we, yeah, he had it, you know, I asked the Lord for four sons, which he gave me, one's in heaven, but, you know, I never knew that I would have to hike, or I probably would have changed my prayer. But, but we hiked, you know, and it was a real challenge, but it was wonderful because we made some wonderful memories, and we were there on lakes by ourselves, just with the boys, and it was a real connecting time. And I just thank the Lord for that, even in spite of the fact that I really didn't like all those miles. I had to hike <laughs> eight, 10 miles one day with a pack on my back. <laughs> awesome. You guys, let's give it up for Bill and Ruth. Thank you guys so much. Now, there. Uh, this week, we had a great opportunity to have an interview with Bill and Ruth, and like the other couples that you've met up here, you can go onto our website. Our, it says one plus one equals one series info. Click that link, and then you'll see Bill and Ruth Larson there and the conversation that we had. I'd love for you to take a listen. We had a great time, and I want you to catch something. Did you hear, by the way, uh, no prompting. No, no one's telling people what to say when they get up here, but did you hear again, Bill and Ruth both say, one of the things that's been so important in our marriage has been the fact that we pray together. That has been said almost week over week from this stage where couples are saying that when we prayed together, that was a huge piece to the story of how we found oneness and the ability to keep moving forward. I just want to encourage you that you want to pay attention to when people have been married for 64 years, you want to pay attention to what they're saying. Because these are things that we want to emulate in our own marriages. We're in the middle of a prayer challenge right now, encouraging couples to pray together for these 21 days. I want to encourage you. We'll continue that through next Sunday, and uh, we'll hear some more. So anyways, great job. Thank you, Bill and Ruth. Appreciate you guys so much. We're in a series called One Plus One Equals One. If you take out your notes inside your Trinity this week, that will help you follow along with us. If you have a Bible today, you're going to make it so easy. Turn to page one, Genesis 1, literally. Genesis 1, find your way there. That's where we'll start today, and uh, we'll kind of give you an opportunity to, uh, to get your, yourself set up this morning. I want to encourage you that there's still time today to join us for our marriage enrichment event called Waffles and Spaghetti. My friends Bill and Pam Farrell are here right now. Bill and Pam, where'd you guys sit, by the way? They're in the back. If you just want to say hello to them real quick and give them a hand, we're glad they're here today. So Bill and Pam, uh, we got to meet them up at Forest Home, working together last summer in a great time. And their, their, um, their time's going to be great. We're going to begin together, then break up guys and girls for the second half of the day. And it's all about understanding how does your spouse process? How do they understand the world and how can you relate better to them as a result? That's what our first session is going to be. Begins today at 2.30 in the afternoon. If you haven't registered yet, you're still welcome. Come find us in the lobby. We'll get you all set up at 2.30 today, just join us, and we'll have a great afternoon together. So I really want to encourage you to, to be a part of that. Well, throughout this series, this is what we've continued to remind ourselves, is that in order to understand how something functions, we have to look at its design. And better yet, we need to talk to the designer. And so what we've done, in order to live out God's design for marriage, we have to pursue the designer and discover how he's intended for us to relate toward each other as we live a lifetime of love. One of the things that we've done week over week, and I want to thank Hilke and Jody last week, did such a great job sharing on responses from spouse to spouse. Hilke shared these same four reminders, and this is important to us because we want to remind ourselves, why are we even doing this? Reminder number one, we've chosen to look at the topic of marriage to provide clarity as to what God's word says about the marriage union he designed. We're not attempting to be political, we're just simply wanting to be biblical. So that's why we're bringing up this subject because we want to see it through God's lens. Number two, this series is primarily aimed at those who are not yet married so that you begin to orient your decisions around God's design for marriage now. So don't be here today and saying, well, I'm not married yet, this, this material is not important for me. We're actually thinking of you. This is why we want to talk about these subjects so now you can have convictions, you can have uh, an understanding, you can have beliefs that would say, God, I want to follow you in making decisions, especially on this topic of sexuality. So for those who aren't married yet, this is really important material today. Please don't miss it. Number three, because God's design for marriage is not lived out fully by any of us, there will be constant reminders where you need to grow and mature. We said this is a series where you need to look in the mirror, not out the window. Stop elbowing your spouse and pay attention to what you need to do, what you need to continue to grow in. 
And finally, number four, no matter what the state of your marriage, seek the truth of God in the spirit of God in, with the grace of God to live out the gift of God that he's given you in one another. We've been making some book recommendations along the way, and today on this topic of marital sexuality, I wanted to recommend a book by Kevin Lehman called Sheet Music. And um, this book is just, I was giving it an overview even again last night. It's just such a great job of helping married couples understand, God, what is your design for sex? How can we engage in such a way that is truly fulfilling for both of us? And it says at the bottom, you can't read it, it's really fine print there, but it even says this on the, um, on the bottom of the picture up there, warning, candid discussions on marital sexual relations. It's very upfront, very clear, very helpful. I've heard, I actually brought Kevin Lehman to do a parenting conference years ago, and he is an incredible communicator. He's one of the funniest guys I've ever heard, but also really great at being able to say, here's God's word, here's this reality of sex, let's talk about them in a helpful way. So, so I want to encourage you, if that could be a help to you, um, let that be something that you um, pick up. I think that's the word I was thinking of, yes. Here's where we begin today. We've got to begin, when, whenever we talk about the subject of sex, we're talking about something incredibly powerful. There's nothing neutral about the topic. It's incredibly powerful in our lives. And it's incredibly powerful for those of us who are married and who are living in his design, the incredible oneness, the incredible connection, the incredible God-given satisfaction that we can find. But it's also equally powerful in terms of its devastation when we live outside of those bounds, when we live outside of what God has said, this is what sex is for and who it's for and why it's for. Anytime we mess with that equation, we are bound to experience something incredibly devastating. And that's what I wanna talk about today. I wanna to talk about this idea of how to see sex through God's lens because sex is God's idea. Don't ever miss that. Don't ever miss the fact that God is the designer, the creator, not just the entire marriage relationship, but sex itself. This was God's idea. And I know how incredibly powerful it can be, both positively and negatively. To the negative side, I was recently on a jury. I haven't talked about this much, but I was on a jury for three weeks, and it was a, a challenging time on a lot of fronts, but one of them was the topic itself. What basically was agreed to in the courtroom from the very beginning is that the, the very least of what happened that day on this crime was that a gentleman had uh, used his stepdaughter as a prostitute. That was agreed to in what the criminal case was that he had raped her at gunpoint. So we know, we know, and, and, and as I share that story, it's not as though it's the first time you've heard something that horrible related to sex. It's used so often outside of God's design and we continue to reap the whirlwind of consequences when we engage in such a way. So I wanna begin this way today. I know that there is, because of the misuse and even abuse of sex, that it's been destructive to varying degrees of people in this room. I want you to hear this as we begin from the very beginning. My hope today is that you would both hear the wisdom and beauty of God's design and recognize that though his gift may have been misused towards you, it does not negate his intent or his design. I also want you to know that you can be healed and that you can be made whole again. I want you to know that hope from the very beginning today. And also for those of us who would say that the destructive power of sex wasn't so much at the hands of others, but it was self-inflicted. I want you to see the beauty and wisdom of God's design as well. And to know that you can experience both the forgiveness and healing of your past and even of your present. I want you to hear from the beginning today that it's not too late. Here's today's now what idea. What are we going to do with this this week? You choose to live in marital oneness when you embrace and live according to God's design for your sexual intimacy. Let's dial in. Number one in your notes. Since sex is God's idea, seek to understand it from his word, the Bible. Since sex is God's idea, seek to understand it from his word, the Bible. I was initially stunned, but then realized later on I shouldn't have been. When I was with a group of nine couples, it was a premarital class, and they were towards the end of the class. I was the substitute um, kind of director teacher that night. So I come into the class. I already knew the topic was sex. And what we began with was just asking the question, who, <coughs> excuse me, who was your teacher? Who was your tutor? Who told you 
about what sex was. And so here we are in this group. There's, um, let's see, nine couples, 18 people. And these 18 young adults around the room, I asked them just briefly, just tell us quickly how you came to know about what sex was. Only two, watch this, only two out of 18 would say either it was their parent with some intentionality or it was a youth pastor. That means 16 out of 18 heard about it from their friends or watched it in media. And let me tell you, those are horrible teachers. Horrible places to find out information for such an incredibly powerful and important topic. And then as we were going around and I was lamenting that, I actually had this moment where I stopped and paused and realized, wait a second, that's how I heard about it too. I'm still waiting to have the talk. <laughs> I don't mean that critically towards my parents, it just never happened. So likewise, it was parents and it, or it was friends and it was media that would be my tutors. And I want to say again, unequivocally, those are horrible teachers on this subject for so many reasons. So what we've done, Joanna grew up in a home where that was a great conversation that they had and very intentional about receiving those kinds of questions from their girls. And we decided to follow that pattern in our home and we've had that intentionality where we've said, hey, we wanna pull you aside as you're getting to a certain age, we wanna to talk to you about the way God's designed it. And we've done it, I think, in a good way. Joanna took the girls on dates, I took Jackson to a Dodger game, I just wanted to say, hey, let's talk about this subject. And you know what? You might not even have a bunch of questions today, but you will, anything is open territory. Anything you wanna talk about, you can always ask. My hope is, is that we would replicate those kinds of homes at Trinity Church where we can raise our kids in a way that we would wanna say, like anything else in your life, I wanna help you understand God's design. So what we're gonna to do today as we look at this, rather than listen to the poor teachers of our culture, let's look today at God's word, his design for sex, and see what the designer would have us know. Letter A in your notes. Though sexual intimacy between a husband and wife has many components, its primary purpose is to demonstrate the glory of God. The primary purpose of sex within a marriage is to demonstrate the glory of God. Genesis 1, your Bibles are open there. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So both genders are part of the image of God. They bear the image of God. And not just alone, but somehow together. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. We've talked a lot about God's design for oneness throughout this series. And as doing so, as we've talked about that, every part of our lives, every part of the overarching design of our lives always is about how does this bring God glory? I think the word glory sometimes, the word glorify, are churchy words. And what I mean by that is they're biblical, don't get me wrong, but we say them and we don't always know what they mean, but because everyone else in the songs that we sing say them, we keep saying them. Simply said, to glorify is to value God for who he really is. The character of God, the design of God, the brilliance of God, it's to value him for who he really is. So we recognize he's the designer of human sexuality and that when we engage his design his way, we learn how to trust him. Because we have a culture who says, don't even think about that lens, don't even think about that approach, try these. We're demonstrating a trust in God that his design, his way is great. We also learn along the way to value his design. And then also we recognize that his design always flows from the heart of a good, good father who always has our best in mind. I want you to see that because I think sometimes, and we'll talk about this today, sometimes sex is presented so much in a don't, don't, don't format that we begin to question the heart of God. We begin to say, God, are you for me? Is this really your best? And we second guess him again and again. I want you to walk away with that understanding today. That God says, Sex is great in this design and nowhere else. And I want you to see that comes because he's protecting you. It comes because he loves you. It comes because he wants your best. And how were Adam and Eve supposed to be fruitful and increase in number and to fill the earth and subdue it if sex wasn't a major part of that mandate? So God says, go, be fruitful, fill the earth. And the way you're gonna do that is through this design of my, my uh, architecture of sex. 
God's response when he saw that man and woman were in the garden and they were living out his design, what did he say? Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. It was very good. I want you to see that God's the author and designer of sex. Letter B in your notes. Sex is based on intentional mutuality due to the new ownership of our bodies. Sex is based on the intentional mutuality due to the new ownership of our bodies. From 1 Corinthians 7, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it, gives it up to her husband. And in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it or gives it up to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves, what? To prayer. That's what we keep talking about. Prayer, praying together. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This passage is very clear and forthright. The authority of our own bodies doesn't belong to us anymore once we enter a marriage relationship with our spouse. Paul was writing to a Corinthian church that that sexual mutuality in their marriages was essential because it was a means of living out the new one flesh relationship they had with each other. There was no room for sexual selfishness or deprivation, but now a release of control of one's body to the other. And the only times for being apart were based on mutuality, a mutual decision, and the purpose of focused prayer. Letter C. Deep satisfaction is intended to be experienced in your marriage's exclusive sexuality. Deep satisfaction is intended to be experienced in your marriage's exclusive sexuality. From Proverbs 5, listen to these words. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed and watch us and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Yes, I just read the word breast from the Bible. (laughs) There's a lot more in there as well. And that's where we'll start. I want you to see that last phrase. May you ever be intoxicated by her love. God's design is that when he brings together a man and wife in their committed covenant marriage for their lifetime, that there would be this consistent connection, this oneness, this intimacy, and in that exclusivity, in that exclusivity, that there would be a great sense of joy and satisfaction. Proverbs is written, the whole purpose of Proverbs, it's written from a father to a son. The first six chapters are all based on my son, my son, my son. And then everything else you know in Proverbs is through that lens of a parent talking to his son and saying, be thoughtful about this, be aware of this, understand this related to God's design. So he talks to him about marriage and he talks to him about how important it is to find that satisfaction exclusively in your wife. No other places, no other women. See the wisdom and advice that was given to a married, from a married man who knows the value of finding sexual satisfaction with his wife, and he encourages his son to likewise tune his attentions toward his wife and his wife alone. I remember in the months leading up to Jackson and Skye's engagement and while they were engaged, numerous conversations that Jackson and I would have related to sexual purity. And as we talked about that and talked about the importance, I told him, not only is this important now on this side of marriage, But likewise, once you're married, I'm going to ask you, how is it going sexually? Because why? Because it's important in your life, not just a sense of purity leading up to, but a consistency and an exclusivity afterwards. I want him to experience the words of Proverbs 5, that there would be this sense of great joy found in his marriage relationship with Sky and with her alone. This is God's design. One of the things that is going to help us today, there's a group, uh, the, the title of their, their, um, their ministry is called the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. They met last year and they developed what they call the Nashville Statement, simply because they met in the city of Nashville. And I want to use a few articles from it. In your notes, I indicated the website where you can pay attention. You can actually read all 14 articles. We're just going to use a few of them today. But I want you to at least be aware. This is, I thought, a very well-stated way of summarizing scripture. 
So understand this today. I'm not trying to say the Nashville statement is on par with scripture. I'm not trying to use it instead of scripture. It's very scripturally based. I just think it summarizes these statements in a really helpful way. Here's article one from the Nashville statement. We affirm that God has has designed marriage to be a covenantal, sexual, procreative, lifelong union of one man and one woman as husband and wife, and is meant to signify the covenant love between Christ and his bride, the church. And each one will affirm and then deny. We deny that God has designed marriage to be a homosexual, polygamous, or polyamorous relationship. We also deny that marriage is a mere human contract rather than a covenant made before God. Let's move on. Number two in your notes. Once you understand the truth of God's design for sex, you'll be able to spot counterfeits. Once you understand God's, uh, the truth of God's design for sex, you'll be able to spot counterfeits. I, I haven't been able to give you a lot today related to God's design, just three ideas within that. There's much more. But even knowing those things, we know there are incredible contrasts to a culture. Some of the hottest topics that you can have in a conversation relate to the cultural debates and lawmaking regarding varying degrees of either ignoring God's design for sex altogether or even battling or rebelling against it. So this is a big deal in our culture. And here's the thing I want you to know. God communicated in advance this was going to happen. See this progression from Romans 1 verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him, there's that word again, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Therefore, God gave them over to, in sexual desires, in the sexual desires, oh, I can't even speak. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Here's what you could do today. Walking out of here, you're going to lunch, you're talking to people. You could talk to virtually anyone in this area, in Southern California, and you could ask this question. By and large, it doesn't matter what their perspective is related to the Bible, their relationship with God or lack thereof. They would, if you ask them, do you think as a culture that we are sexually confused and over-sexualized, and most anybody on the street will tell you yes, because it's just the clear and blatant truth. No matter where you go and what you see, you continue to see images and messages related to live this out against outside of God's design. So God's word tells us why this was going to happen. Due to their rejection of God and his authority over their lives, he gave them over to sinful desires as they have pursued, as they have worshipped, as they have served, created things like our, own, like our own human bodies, rather than their creator and living according to his design for all things, including their sexual behavior. This is the way it's described in the National Statement, Article 9. We affirm that sin distorts sexual desires by directing them away from the marriage covenant and towards sexual immorality, a distortion that includes both heterosexual and homosexual immorality. We deny that an enduring pattern of desire for sexual immorality justifies sexually immoral behavior. And by the way, that's probably one of the most consistent arguments in our culture is that I have these feelings, they must be okay. And we're just saying through a biblical lens, there's something they have to stop and think about related to that. Just because there's desires doesn't mean that's according to God's design. So knowing what we know of God's design and understanding that our culture is at odds with it on so many fronts, including our sexuality, we have clarity from the Bible on two very important things. Number one, we know what is God's authentic design for sex. And number two, we know what is a counterfeit. Here's what we know. We know what God's authentic design for sex is, and we know what is a counterfeit. If God's authentic design for sexuality is the oneness union of a husband and a wife for their lifetime, then what fits into the category of counterfeit? Watch this. Anything and everything else. Anything and everything else. So I want you to hear this today. 
If once you heard that we were talking about sex today, and then the question is, well, what's he going to say about X, Y, Z issue related to human sexuality? I want you to hear from the beginning today that neither me nor Trinity Church have any type of bias, have any type of reaction against anything outside of God's design specifically, but we would say categorically they all fit outside of God's design. Therefore, they're a counterfeit. So what about homosexual behavior? Counterfeit. What about homosexual marriage? Counterfeit. What about transgender modification? Counterfeit. But watch this. That's where some of us would go. Those are the biggies we're going to talk about. Watch this. You're going to lose perspective if you don't keep walking us through the same scenario. Premarital heterosexual sex. Counterfeit. Cohabitating sexual relationship. Counterfeit. Adulterous affair. Counterfeit. Pornography. Counterfeit. Denying your spouse sexually. Counterfeit. Acting selfishly, sexually towards your spouse. Counterfeit. Here's what I want you to hear. All of those and more, anything outside of God's design is a counterfeit. We need to begin processing them, not just as the ones that we would say, oh, I really think these are outside of God's design, but I'm going to pay very little attention to these others over here. They all fit the same category. They're all a distortion of what God has said. This is my design. This is my will. This is what I have for you. Anything outside of that, not only is not God's design, but what I want to keep reiterating today, it is not for your good. It is not for your good. Devastation awaits. I want to ask you a question today. I don't know if this has happened to you. It hasn't happened to me yet, but I'm sure it will at some point. Have you ever gone to a store, retail or whatever, and when you've gone to pay, they take their magic marker pen, right? Take their magic marker pen, and, and that's one way they can detect a counterfeit. You don't have to raise your hand, but if that's ever happened to you, it's, it's happened to all of us that they've used the pen, but if it's happened to you when your bill became a counterfeit, you, I mean, it was, you just didn't know it. I'm, I'm trusting no actual counterfeiters are here today. <laughs> I got a bill for you after this service, Todd. You know, I'm trusting that's not the case. But you pass one along that you didn't know. They use the magic marker pen. They realize there's a counterfeit. You have one of two options now. Now that you know the truth about what you've been holding that you thought was of value, now you have one of two options. One is to take it back and to be able to go, okay, it's not going to work here today. But the next time I'm in another environment, I'm going to use it and pass it off as though it's legitimate, pass it off as though it's the real thing and does have true value when it doesn't. Or I can do what the authorities would say, and that would actually be to hand it over to the authorities and let them destroy it. Now, by the way, they're not going to refund your money. So it comes at a loss. But it comes at a loss of doing the right thing. Can I ask you this question today? If you are here today and you're considering decisions and choices that you're making related to sexuality, and if you've been living and walking in a counterfeit, you have the same choice today. You have the same crossroads conversation to have. One choice is to say, well, God, I realize this isn't your design, but I really don't know why it's a problem. I really, and you have all the, I know, I know all those excuses. But you're going to choose to say, I'm going to keep trying to pass this off as though it's authentic and not want to deal with the reality that not only is it outside of God's design, but it's going to have devastating problems. Or you can do this. You can do what we just said a minute ago. You can take this area of living outside God's design of sex and you can hand it over to the authority, to the authority of God. And say, God, I recognize that this is out of bounds. I recognize maybe I didn't even know it till today. Maybe I knew it, didn't want to deal with it. May have known it for a long time. But either way, I want to hand it over to you and let you be in control of this area of my life, just like every other area of my life that I need to surrender over to you. You have that choice. It's staring you in the face today. All of these and anything else under God's that are outside of God's design are sexual counterfeits as far as God's concerned. And we need to see them out of the lens of his care for us and wanting to protect us. But we also need to come clean before him related to our failures. I did a, a search this week. I was trying to you know, think through what I could remember, but also looking at some other passages. And this is what I typed in the Google bar. I said, 
sexuality according to the Bible. That's what I typed in, sexuality according to the Bible. And one of the first websites that popped up talked about these different verses related to, okay, good, that's what I wanted to look for. So I click on it, and as I'm scrolling through the verses, remember a topic, sexuality in the Bible, one of the verses that popped up was 1 John 1, 9. And the verse said, if you know it, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's what I want you to, the verse is absolutely true, but I want you to see something. I did not type in sexual immorality in the Bible. I just typed in sexuality in the Bible. And the inference is this, that if you are looking at the topic of sexuality, it must be related to the fact that there's sin in the mix. And see, the problem is, is that it's true when we look over the vast reality of scripture, so many passages in the Bible say, thou shalt not related to sexuality because of the practices, because of the behaviors that we and everyone in our planet have engaged that are outside of the design of God. So God is very clear, not only what is his design, but saying, as opposed to, this is not in my design. But it's a sad truth that when we think of just simply sexuality, we instantly think of sin. This website Put it that way, and the reality is is that it's true. It is vast, and it is a big problem. Maybe the most important thing to begin with today is simply this. If you're here today, and you're dealing with the weight of sexual sin, I want you to realize that you're far from alone. I want you to realize that you're far from alone. Most people in this room, including this guy on the stage, has struggled with or is struggling, are struggling with these realities of God's design for sex. So simple question, what are we to do? Well, we begin with the verse. The verse from the website was absolutely appropriate. First John 1, 9, if we confess, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And second, what are we to do? Not only in that confession and realizing, knowing God's transformational cleansing, but also we're called to action, to run from sexual sin, to pursue God's design, because you as a follower of Jesus are no longer your own, but his. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 6. By the way, have you noticed how many times we're in the book of 1 and 2 Corinthians? Corinthians was an incredibly over-sexualized, sexually confused culture we can understand, like we get it. This is what it says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. A call to be cleansed, a call to walk forward, understanding we're not our own. Brings us to our final point today, number three. Once you understand sex's design, live according to it. Once we understand what is God's design and what is not, now we're called to live that out. A in your notes, maintain sexual chastity prior to marriage and sexual fidelity within it. Maintain sexual chastity prior to marriage and sexual fidelity within it. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. Chastity is probably one of the most common words that is misunderstood. We don't really know what it means. Abstinence means this, simply abstaining, keeping from sexual behavior, but not necessarily because it's something you want to do. You just simply are, that's the outward expression of that. Chastity is all about the heart. It's a decision to say, God, I want to live according to your design. I have this as my heartbeat. It's a choice, not something mandated on me. You might be able to say it this way. Abstinence is something that you might feel forced to do. Chastity is something you choose. One of the articles, Article 2, we affirm that God's revealed will for all people is chastity outside of marriage and fidelity within marriage. Conversely, we deny that any affections, desires, or commitments ever justify sexual intercourse before or outside of marriage, nor do they justify any form of sexual immorality. Letter B, if you failed to live in God's design for sexuality, recognize that he both forgives you when you confess your sins and he heals you with his power to redeem. I, I would hate for you to walk out today feeling as though the weight 
of sexual sin that you might have walked in here today is still on your shoulders when you walk out. Because the Bible says that there can be healing. The Bible says there is forgiveness. The Bible says that there is a pathway to living out God's design even when you have messed up. There's no, there's no final, ultimate mess up related to sex. We'll see that clearly in just even a moment. One of my favorite verses comes when it comes to God's redeeming power to change and transform lives, again, from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's a long list, sexual sins included. And that is what some of you were. Paul says, by nature, by the way you're lived, the totality of your life, this is what it looked like. Watch this. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And that is what some of you were. What a powerful testimony when we would be a people who would say, that is who I was. It's no longer who I am. And I'm walking forward in this reality. And watch this. Did you notice those verbs? They're all passive. You were washed. You didn't wash yourself. You were sanctified. You were justified. God did those things for you that you could not do for yourself. Through the death and resurrection of his son and through the empowering of his Holy Spirit. That is powerful information. Article 12, we affirm that the grace of God in Christ gives both merciful pardon and transforming power. And that this pardon and power enable a follower of Jesus to put to death sinful desires and to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Conversely, we deny that the grace of God in Christ is insufficient to forgive all sexual sins and, and to give power for holiness for every believer who feels drawn into sexual sin. Finally today, letter C, recognize that the most important thing about your identity is not related to sex, but to your Savior. Most important thing about your identity is not related to sex, but to your Savior. That is one of the huge problems that we face today, is as we talk about identity, it often refers to sexuality. It is not the most important thing about who you are, is sexuality the most important thing is the fact that there's a Jesus who died on a cross for you. Look at these affirmations in Article 13, uh, 14. We affirm that Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners, and that through Christ's death and resurrection, forgiveness of sins and eternal life are available to every person. Every person who repents of sin and trusts in Christ alone as Savior, Lord, and supreme treasure. We deny, I love this phrase, we deny that the Lord's arm is too short too short to save or that any sinner is beyond his reach. Here's my purpose in prayer today. Why did we talk about this subject? Why are we looking at the issue of sex through God's lens today? Because number one, I want you to know the truth. I want you to know what God says on this very important subject. You have so many voices screaming other information. But the other reason is this. As a people, as Trinity Church, both in our brokenness and in our wholeness, my prayer is that we would be a people who would say, God, we want to honor you in your design. For those who are not yet married and for those who already are, we want to honor you in your design. And we want to live according to your way because that will scream to a world who says, I don't even begin to get it. Why would this matter to you? Why is this important to you? We would say, because it's important to God. So what's our now what statement? What are we to do this week? You choose to live in marital oneness when you embrace and live according to God's design for your sexual intimacy. Let me pray. Father, we've looked at an incredibly powerful, um, just kind of attention-grabbing uh, idea today of your design for sex. And the reality is very few of us in here today come in at some sort of neutral point. The reality is that for some of us, we're living out this design, experiencing your blessing, and being grateful, God, for what you've given. But there are still so many, God, who are living outside of your design for one reason or another. Those who have even had this done to them, God. And as a result, sex is such a, a, just a horrible topic to have to walk into. My prayer is today is that we would know your power to heal. We would know your power to pardon. We would know your power to transform, God. And we would be a people who would say, 
Not because we sign some covenant, not because we stand up and are really loud, just simply the way of our lives would mirror and demonstrate your design for your gift. Like the last point today, if you're here today and you would say, you know, not only is the way that I've lived my life related to sexuality outside of, my, of God's design, I, I've done very little to even care about what God's design is for any part of my life. And if you're here today and you would say, Todd, I am interested not just in my sexuality becoming under God's authority and leadership, but all of my life. I want to respond in terms of a relationship. I want to bring my sins, God, to his feet. I want to tell you great news today is that you can do that. It begins with A, admitting. Admitting that you're a sinner who needs a savior. Admitting that in this and so many other areas of your life, you've lived outside of God's design. But B is to believe. Believe this Jesus we've talked about today. He lived a sinless life. He died a sacrificial death. He was raised supernaturally on the third day. Believe that he took the punishment that you and I and everyone in this room deserved. Believe he's the only savior available. C is choose. Choose to say today, Jesus, in every area of my life, I'm going to trust you for what you've done for me I couldn't do for myself. And I want to walk, I want to follow in your footsteps today. You can make that choice today, and my prayer is that you would. Father, we love you. Thank you for your amazing grace over us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So to, to close out this morning, we're going to sing a song that uh, just declares, Lord, we don't want to live a counterfeit life. We don't want to live a life that's anything but, but what you have called us to live. So uh, let's stand together. It's a, it's a fun, upbeat song, and let's sing this out as we close this morning.
guys, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I want to remind you that there'll be people up here who would love to pray with you if you would like prayer. Um, besides that, go ahead and have a great Sunday.